that you're going to be a great audience, although you have some stiff competition because my five-year-old, uh, I asked him to listen to my, um, my intro as I was reading over it and he got about two sentences in and said, mama, I don't want to listen to this. So I know you're going to do better than that. Um, but I have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, so please keep yourself muted because we just don't want any background noises um, that will be distracting to our speaker. If you have questions for Jonathan, please type them into the chat box and I'll read them out loud at breaks during the program and then at the end. If you have any clarifying or follow-up questions um, after your question is answered, you can unmute and jump in with that. Um, tomorrow, you're gonna get an email, possibly the day after, Gordon, depends on how long the, uh, the recording takes us to upload um, with a private link to the presentation um, and any notes we might have for you. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, we hope that you'll join us for something of some of our upcoming events. You saw some of those uh, floating through Gordon's slide deck, um, but also the rest of our uh, food cycle symposium. Um, and just so you know, we'll be raffling off compost bins for the attendees. So the more lectures you attend, the more chances you have to win. I didn't know that. I was keeping it a surprise for me. That is such a good Ooh. surprise. Thank you, Noah. Um, and just a reminder, um, there are some really great benefits to becoming a member of DCH. So visit the dch.org uh, for more information. Uh, we'd also like to thank DENREC, the D Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control uh, for making this series possible. We're so pleased to have Jonathan Bloom with us this evening. Jonathan is a journalist, a consultant, and a thought leader on the topic of food waste. He wrote a book called American Wasteland and has a website called Wasted Food. He's spoken on food waste from all over the world um, and has consulted with places like the United Nations and Harvard Law School. Most recently, he helped create Food Matters, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation's free educational resource. Uh, Jonathan is from Boston, but now lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife and two sons. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan. All right, <clears throat> thank you so much for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, you forgot to mention that I live in Durham, North Carolina with my family and many, many containers for leftovers. I always want to stress that, get that in there. Um, okay, so let's see, as I'm getting this whole thing together, um, uh, I wanted to just express my gratitude for, for you having me here. I wish that I could actually be there in person, uh, but on the flip side, at least this way, at the end of the talk, we can, uh, we can go around and show each other how the insides of our refrigerator look. So that's a nice little bonus of being on Zoom. <clears throat> just kidding, just kidding. We don't have to do that. Um, anyhow, um, this is obviously a crazy time that we're living through and I don't need to explain that to anyone listening in, but because of that, it's hard to know where to focus. And a lot of times we, we stray from uh, where we should be focusing. But from my perspective, there's never been a better time to focus on food waste. Um, there's more waste than ever at the production level and all throughout the food chain. And at the same time, there's more need than ever, uh, in particular, uh, at the household level, like looking around at our neighbors and folks in our community, there's a tremendous amount of need. So because of that juxtaposition, I think it's, it's all the more important to focus on wasted food as a topic. So let's dive in. Okay, so a couple of big picture statistics for you. Um, you know, on the global level, about a third of the food produced is not eaten. Closer to home in the US, it's, it's even worse. 40% is wasted. And that adds up, as you see there, it has a pretty significant cost uh, in terms of the overall poundage and the financial impact of that food waste. And even closer to home, we don't use about a quarter of the food that we bring home for a variety of reasons. So, those are a bunch of numbers and statistics that, that convey this, this massive scale here, but I am a big believer in uh, using images to, to convey the situation. So here's 
an image for you. This is the Rose Bowl, that 90,000 seat stadium in Southern California. And every day, America is wasting enough food to fill that stadium. And in fact, not just fill it once, but to fill it twice with food that is wasted. So that's if we were to bring all of our wasted food to one central location uh, every day, we're, we're squandering enough to fill that stadium. So just this massive amount of wasted food. So where is this happening? That's the next logical question. And the short answer there is everywhere at all points of the food chain. But the waste certainly starts at the farm level where, where food is created. And unfortunately, many items that are, are grown to feed people never leave the farm. And in part, this is because of the long distance food chain that we have. Uh, so shippers and growers know that food needs to survive that thousand mile journey. Um, in many cases, a longer trip from an, uh, another country or even the other side of the globe. And so you have images like this one. Uh, this is an iceberg lettuce farm I visited in Salinas, California, and they've the, the hardworking pickers have already gone through the fields and these are heads of lettuce that they've left behind. Uh, they, they weren't quite good enough to make that journey and a lot of them would be perfectly good at that point in time, but maybe a week later or two weeks later, they wouldn't be in great shape. So they are left in the fields to be plowed under. Uh, the waste continues on at the supermarket level where oftentimes food is, is doomed to an early grave because of a date stamped on its package. And so continuing the journey of the lettuce, you know, it, for some of those heads of lettuce or, or leaves uh, that, that made it maybe from California to the East Coast, uh, they had a date stamped on that package. And if it's approaching that date, the retailer's probably going to toss it out. And in the back of just about every supermarket in America, if you went into the dumpster, you'd find a troubling amount of edible food. The waste continues on at the, the food service level in restaurants and cafeterias, where oftentimes the, the portion sizes are, are so large that they doom these kinds of leftovers uh, to happen. And we see this, and anyone who's really worked in a restaurant before has, has, uh, is probably nodding their head, has seen an image like that. Okay, and finally, the waste continues on at the household level. And uh, you're probably uh, wondering how I, I got a picture of the inside of your fridge. Let's just say technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, I'll keep my secrets to myself, but uh, if this looks familiar, keep in mind that uh, we often create this kind of clutter in our refrigerator where we, we often create situations where we couldn't possibly use all of those foods before they go bad. We, we have too much stuff and out of sight tends to be out of mind. And as a result, there's a, an awful lot of food that gets forgotten about and discovered weeks or months later in uh, a different shape or condition perhaps. Okay, so um, this might be a good chance to pause to see if there are any questions thus far. I'll, I'll have a couple of, of pauses where y'all can ask questions and uh, through the chat and Nora can, can let me know if there are any questions. And then of course, at the end, I'll, I'll be around for plenty of time to answer questions then. Um, so right now so we, far? We don't have any questions in the chat so far, but if you do have one, please feel free to type it in. Uh, we're getting a couple now. Um, we did have uh, someone have a panic attack because she thought you were gonna show, ask her to show her, her refrigerator. <laughs> um, uh, Brie says, do you think healthier food is thrown out more often because it's so expensive? Um, I think 
Well, I think it might go the opposite way. Uh, when we spend a lot on food, we are probably more careful with it. But I think most healthier foods that I'm thinking of tend to be fairly perishable. And so there's just uh, less wiggle room and less room for error. Um, so yeah, in, in many cases, we create that situation, that cluttered refrigerator, um, in part due to impulse buys at the store. And uh, if we, I mean, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but um, it's sometimes hard to resist those temptations. And we end up creating this uh, ticking time bomb in our refrigerator. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... Vic is saying that he recently invested in some silicone storage bags. Are there any other reusable products that can help reduce both food waste and use of disposable plastics that you would recommend? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, anything that you can use again is quite helpful in avoiding those single use items. And I, I think that's kind of the, the rule of thumb that I would advise is to just use whatever you can as much as you can and try not to buy something just um, that, that's going to be used one time. And um, I'm often struck when I get takeout at the quality of the packaging that you receive. Um, and not every place and a lot of restaurants have gotten better at, um, you know, thinning out their packaging and having it be recyclable and um, not excessively durable, but um, I'm sure others of you, this will ring true, like having visitors from another country remark at like the sturdiness of the packaging that you receive from a restaurant. And so if that's the case, then it's perfectly reasonable to clean it and use it again. Thank you. Um, Dee is asking, is there a movement to address the expiration date dilemma? Mm. Yes, um, the short answer is there is, um, and, and I can, I'll get into that a little bit more as we move along, but, um, but yeah, as a, uh, a bit of a tease for later in the talk, there's a, a campaign that you might wanna pay attention for, and I'll, I'll talk about that in uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, last question for right now in the chat uh, from Anna, or I'm sorry, Anne. Do your percentages of wasted food from stores include what is donated to food banks and food pantries? Ah, is that a separate yeah. number? No, <clears throat> excellent question. Um, no, if, if food finds another home, then it's um, not certainly not wasted. And that's a big part of this whole equation is um, basically repurposing or redistributing that excess food. So that's a, a real happy ending and a uh, a victory. So uh, that's not included in the waste numbers. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we can move on. Okay, great. Good question so far. I'm excited for, for more. Okay, so what the heck is happening here? No one wants to waste food, so why are we wasting about 40% of what we produce? Well, there's several main drivers of wasted food and I'll go through them one by one. The first is abundance. And what I mean there is that we're producing about twice the amount of calories that we need as a country. And so built into our system is this excess. And so you'll have entire fields that aren't harvested because maybe the price of that good doesn't justify the expenditure. Or maybe something goes wrong with the field. Maybe there's a pest or an infestation. Um, but regardless, there's, there's a real excess or abundance at the primary level and really all throughout the food chain. Um, so this image here depicts that abundance. And this is a shot from a gleaning outing in North Carolina. This is the big gleaning day of the year called the yam jam and uh, that's it's as you might guess uh gleaning sweet potatoes that otherwise would be plowed under 
And that image there is, is just a fraction of what was recovered on one morning. And we could have been out there for days and still not collected all of the, the sweet potatoes out in the field. So that really conveys the excess in our system. And uh, the other thing I would say about abundance is that because we constantly are confronted with food in such massive scales and quantities, it, it cheapens our sense of food. And so there is not only a literal cheapening in terms of the dollars and cents, um, because we have such a glut of most foods, but there's a, a cheapening of, of value and whether or not we treat that food carefully. And in most cases, when we have a lot of something, we don't tend to be very careful with it. Um, now, with the pandemic, the food system has been disrupted and there's been uh, even more waste at the primary or farm level. And that's a lot of times due to shifting demand. Growers don't necessarily know what to produce. They've had buyers back out on certain orders. Um, everything's just a bit off. And so when that happens, uh, you see uh, scenes like this where you have all these beautiful squash that don't have a place to go. And there are some remedies we'll get into a bit later, but the results are pretty disturbing. Okay, and the last uh, facet of abundance to talk about is at the restaurant level. And um, what I really mean there, uh, as I hinted at before, is portion size. And we are constantly being put in this strange position where we're served a lot of food, probably more food than you want, probably more food than is healthy to consume at one time, depending on your appetite and size. Um, but uh, when we do get put in this particularly bad position, we kind of have two bad options. We can either overeat or waste food. Now there's another option, which is taking that food home, taking the leftovers home. Some people don't like taking leftovers home. I don't understand these folks, but I'm trying to learn how you work. Um, other people might not be going straight home. Maybe it's inconvenient or um, you know they're on a road trip or whatever it may be. So unfortunately, we're often put in, in this place where there aren't any good options. And the, the sad part about restaurant abundance, um, well, there's two sad things. First of all, it's a root cause of not only wasted food, but in many cases, obesity, uh, as, as we're basically uh, pushed to eat more than we should be eating. And then on this, the other hand, the idea of what a reasonable amount of food to eat at one time has shifted and has, has increased over the years in part due to what we encounter at restaurants. So now when we're serving our friends and family at socially distanced outdoor gatherings, of course, the, the idea or concept of, of the right amount of food to serve to people has changed a bit. And that could be another driver of waste and perhaps overeating. Okay, um, the next topic to discuss with, with wasted food and, and why we're wasting so much food is this idea of beauty. And we're operating with this mindset our food system operates with this mindset that appearance trumps taste. And so anything that's the wrong shape, size, color, or God forbid is blemished in any way will get tossed aside at some point in that journey from farm to fork. And so in order to have that perfect display that you see there, there are countless others that um, do not make that end goal of, of getting to your home refrigerator or fruit basket. And most of you folks who grow food or are gardeners know that, that food does not grow to look perfect and plants um, 
create things in all kinds of unique and different ways. And so this, this concept of perfection is a, a, an abstract uh, superficial concept that's put upon us by the stores. And it's sort of a two-way street as well because we are sending the message that we want perfection. So it's a two-way street and undoing it will, will require action from both sides. But um, to delve a little closer into this topic, this is a guy named Nick who has a pear orchard in California, Nick Avisevich. And I visited him to talk about what does and does not get harvested. And he was walking me through his orchard after the pickers had come through. They were just gonna come through once that year because the labor shortages um, made it such that that he could only get a crew to come through once, whereas ideally it would be twice a year. Uh, but anyway, he was pulling down individual pairs and he had a hard time finding what was wrong with some of them. Some of them looked perfectly good. Uh, maybe the pickers had a sense that they wouldn't survive that cross country trip as well. But when he did find things to point out, I mean, they're, they're pretty uh, marginal flaws, uh, any kind of little blemish as you see there would doom those pears to this end of uh, just being tossed onto the ground and rotting in a pile next to the tree. And so uh, that, that drive for perfection and homogeneity uh, required essentially that image of a bunch of pears rotting uh, on the ground. And we could do better. There are some remedies, but um, unfortunately they are not in place in most places. Okay, the next driver of wasted food is cost. <clears throat> okay, so when you look at the amount that Americans spend on their groceries, it is near historic lows. Um, in terms of the percentage of household spending that goes toward food, no other nation spends as little on their food as we do. And I would argue that this has a knock-on impact on how we approach our food. As I mentioned before, we don't tend to treat things carefully if we don't pay much for it or if there's an abundance of it. Um, I like this picture here because not only does it convey the cheapness of a food item, I mean, 99 cents per ribs, that's pretty good, but um, has a nice bit of cultural insensitivity or at least incongruity um, and very timely as well. Um, Passover pork ribs were not all that popular where I grew up, but who knows, maybe Johnny's food master knows something that I don't. Uh, but anyhow, the, uh, the point remains, uh, food is, is pretty inexpensive when you look at the percentage of our budget that we allocate toward it. And so as a result, we don't treat food carefully and we waste probably more than we should. As I said before, about a quarter of the food we bring home, we don't use. Okay, um, last big topic here in terms of causes of wasted food is this lost food knowledge. And now what I mean there is that, well, for many of us, at least before the pandemic, we hadn't done much cooking. Uh, our, as a culture, we collectively stepped out of the kitchen and allowed supermarkets and restaurants to do that for us. And so a lot of folks are at this point where they don't know how to stretch their food supply. They don't know how to store foods properly, um, how long things will last, and how to make meals out of what they have on hand. And this label here really illustrates that point. Uh, this is a, a packaged, uh, this is a, a take home box from a restaurant. And you'll see at the bottom there it says, when in doubt, throw it out. And um, from my perspective, that's the exact wrong message to send because we're already pretty good at doing that. 
uh, we're, we're unfortunately quite skilled at throwing things out, but um, it's a, a, bit, a bit strange advice to throw on the box there. And in smaller print, you might not be able to see it, but they're saying to <clears throat> use that food within 24 hours of receiving. And so um, that might be good advice if you don't have a refrigerator. Uh, I think most people here do have a refrigerator. And if that's the case, it's probably very excessive advice. Um, so there's sort of this, this sense of why take a chance um, in a real aggressive drive to get people to throw away food. So that's sort of what we're up against here. And um, tied into that concept of lost food knowledge is the ubiquity of expiration dates. And so you see these date labels on just about every food item um, from not only bottles of milk, but to individual eggs or to my favorite bottles of water, which is um, pretty strange. Um, uh, I don't remember the last time I had rancid water, but um, I'm pretty sure that you can risk it drinking something past the date stamped on the bottle. But anyhow, you probably already know that most of these date labels are, are excessively cautious and they um, don't necessarily convey when something goes bad, but you might not know that the only food item required by federal law to have a date label on it is infant formula. And so that, that really conveys that these date labels are about quality. They're about the texture or taste of a food or drink and not about food safety. But not many people know about those. And so that's a real driver of wasted food because we, we treat that date as the gospel truth on when that food item is going to go bad. And um, a news flash for you, the, the food does not expire at midnight on the day stamped on the package. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit later about the, the remedy for that. But um, I wanted to move on a tiny bit and Shifting gears, so we've, we've talked about where food waste happens and you know what is driving that 40% loss, but what's the big deal? Why should you care? Uh, many of you, some of you might be wondering that yourself. Okay, so obviously there's the, the money being squandered um, I don't really focus on that much, uh, but it's a significant amount, more than $400 million, but um, uh, <clears throat> on an annual level. But, you know, at closer to home, that might look like about $2,000 a year in food thrown away. So nothing to sneeze at. That's certainly a motivator. But I think on a, a higher plane, there are two main factors to focus on. Um, it, the ethics of the topic and the environmental impact. So I'll start with the ethics at, at play here. And when I think about wasted food and the, the moral or ethical implications, there's a saying that comes to mind for me. And if we were in person, I'd have you all call it out or, or shout out what was going through your mind. But since we're on Zoom, I'm, I'm sure you were all thinking about this, this saying of clean your plate because there are children starving somewhere. And the somewhere tends to shift depending on when you grew up. Um, <clears throat> I, I heard clean your plate because there are children starving in Africa. And um, being kind of a wise guy as a kid, I would tell my parents that Africa, well, like where in Africa? Africa is not a country, guys. Could you be more specific? But anyhow, um, the, the larger point here is, is that that saying, it's a little bit problematic, um, not just for geographical reasons, but 
It uses guilt as a motivator. And I don't think that's the healthiest uh, thing to invoke at the dinner table. Uh, it's also logistically inaccurate. The food on your plate is never going to help someone else outside of your household for logistical and um, I don't know, what's uh, food safety reasons, we'll say. But, and this is a, a rather large but, there's a kernel of truth in that saying, and there's a reason it has stuck around so long. And that is because this juxtaposition of hunger and waste is incredibly problematic. And I would say it's morally callous to, to know about that hunger in the world and to waste food freely. So the, uh, the idea of hunger, a lot of times when, when people think about people being hungry, they get this image of the Great Depression and uh, a big line for Oh, coffee and donuts. That sounds pretty good. But uh, lining up because of need, and uh, certainly there was plenty of that in the Great Depression. But the idea of hunger is not history, and unfortunately is alive and well. And uh, especially these days, uh, we're seeing so many scenes like this one where folks are, are out of work, and need a helping hand to put food on the table. So even more reason not to waste food. And so that, that, that coexistence of hunger and waste is a real paradox. And to have 15% of American households food insecure while 40% of food being wasted, to me is motivation to change this equation and to waste less food, to be a, a more morally and ethically healthy person. And there is a sense that uh, you can help, not just in not wasting food, but also in uh, contributing to food drives and, and getting food to those in need. The, the stuff on your plate is one thing, like that's, that's, for you to consume in your house, but you know things that are wrapped or, or canned or uh, haven't been touched, um, that certainly is a great thing to donate to people in need. And even better than that, growing food to donate because um, it's perhaps even healthier. Anyhow, uh, to, to cap off this discussion, uh, I, I think the, the Pope's words here are quite Poetic, throwing away food is like stealing from the table of the poor and the hungry. And I really can't add anything to that. It's beautiful. Okay, so on the other hand, uh, there are several environmental factors at play with the wasted food problem. <clears throat> All right, so as far as I know, we just have this one planet here, but we need to treat it carefully. And wasting food is doing anything but treating that planet carefully. So when we squander food, we're wasting resources, natural resources, uh, primarily the, the oil or petroleum that goes into producing our food. And our food system is incredibly embedded with oil um, or oil is embedded in agriculture from everything from fertilizing to planting, harvesting, processing that food, shipping it across the country or farther, cooling it all the way, the energy used in cooking that food. And then later on when we're done with it or don't use it, hauling it off to landfills. So it's just a tremendous amount of energy goes into producing that food. Um, as you see there, about 4% of all energy used in the country is embedded in food that's not used, that's wasted. And above that, if we were to end all the avoidable waste, which isn't necessarily all the waste, 
but um, the easily avoidable waste, that would be the same thing as, as getting a quarter of the cars off the road from an emission standpoint. So pretty significant there. Another resource at play here, and one that I'm sure all you gardeners will be well attuned to is water or irrigation. And when we waste food, we're wasting the water that goes into producing that food. And so the estimate that, that you see there is that about a quarter of all freshwater usage that's grown, that's used to, to produce food is, uh, is going into food that isn't used. And so this massive amount, 40 trillion liters of irrigating or irrigation is embedded in food we toss. Uh, so that's just this, this huge amount of water, but it's kind of hard to imagine what that looks like. Uh, but here's a, an image for you. This is the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And every year, America is wasting a Great Salt Lake, a Great Salt Lake's worth of water through food being squandered. And um, I should point out it's fresh water, not salt water, even though that salt lake is obviously not fresh water. Um, one other thing to throw your way with certainly um, not all foods are created equally in terms of their impact. And um, beef tends to be a real uh, big user of water in addition to emissions created. But um, one hamburger, the, uh, the amount of water that goes into producing that, that one quarter pound burger is equivalent to a 90 minute shower. So every hamburger you're, you're eating at home is uh, the same as taking a 90 minute shower. So hopefully we're not gonna waste that burger uh, for that reason and several others. Okay, and the other thing to talk about with wasted food when it does get thrown away and it ends up in a landfill, we are creating methane. And essentially it's uh, this unfortunate equation there of, of food being buried in a landfill equals uh, too much methane, more methane than you want, considering that methane is more than 25 times as harmful as CO2 when it comes to trapping heat. Uh, so anything that decomposes uh, anaerobically without air, uh, then methane is created. And we're basically filling the ground with uh, this steady supply of methane that will slowly seep out or, and be vented uh, from the landfill. And so that is why composting is very important to prevent that situation, to prevent the methane being created and also to create a usable product. Uh, but more on that a tiny bit later. Okay, so you sort of add all that together, uh, especially the, the carbon impact and the methane impact and eight to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions stem from wasted food. So it's just this, this huge target um, and all the, all the energy that goes into producing food that's wasted, uh, the, the transportation, the cooking, the refrigeration, the packaging, and then the methane from landfills, uh, all gets funneled into that statistic of eight to 10%. Uh, so it's just this massive amount and that cuts both ways. And that's why I like to talk about the impact and the opportunity of food waste. So it's having a, a very significant impact on climate change, but there's also an opportunity here. Um, it's a huge target. So if we can dramatically reduce the amount of food being wasted, then we can have a huge impact on the climate change situation. And just quantifying that, um, that dilemma there and that opportunity, Project Drawdown, they run all kinds of scenarios on our planet warming. And the first time they ran these numbers of reducing food waste was the number three most impactful solution to reverse global warming. 
the second time they ran the scenarios, reducing food waste was the number one most important or impactful solution. So just this major opportunity, if we can focus on it and uh, target the problem and dramatically reduce the amount of food being wasted. So a real opportunity. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for a second before we focus on seizing that opportunity and affecting change. And I'll, I'll see if anyone has any questions to this point. Great, um, thank you. So we have a couple of questions here. So if you, folks, if you have more, please add them to the chat. Um, Anne would like to know, um, you said that uh, there's about $2,000 per year wasted in food. Is that per person or per family? Uh, that's a four, the average four person household. And there's like four estimates. There's like, they have four different levels, like the thrifty family onto, you know, the average family to uh, maybe a more affluent family. But um, that's a pretty conservative estimate. It, it used to be, I mean, the, the highest level there is closer to $2,800 a year. But I try and err on the side of uh, being conservative. Um, this is my personal question. Um, I've been seeing a lot about things like misfits markets. Um, and, but then also here, which is for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a program where you can buy sort of ugly produce. Uh, but then I've heard people say, well, that stuff was going to be made into baby food anyway, so you're not really saving a whole lot um, in terms of food waste. And I'm wondering if you have facts or opinions about <laughs> that sort of argument. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that argument makes sense in theory, but in reality, that's not really how the secondary market works. Like the, the uh, baby food makers contract out for their supply, like they're, they're not going to the farmer's market and like picking one or two here or there. They're really making sure that they, they have a steady supply and it might be seconds, but those companies, um, there's a few of them, Misfits, Imperfect and Hungry Harvest, um, they are basically finding the, the other ones that haven't been contracted and will be falling through the cracks if they don't. Uh, send them out. So yeah, they're doing they're doing good work. And actually, we'll I can uh, show. There's a few images of what that looks like later. Can you repeat the names for a minute? <clears throat> yeah, sure. And and I'll I think it'll come up later. But it's imperfect. Uh, Misfits That's market and hungry okay. harvest. Okay. Yep. Thank you. It was sure. imperfect that I didn't. Yeah, and I checked before this talk, and I they all all three are serving the Delaware region. So great. Um, Suzanne is asking, how is composting better than landfill? Um, and then she says, food still decomposes. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Um, it's really just with compost. There's a an exposure to air, so either. If you're doing it at home, you turn that pile, whether it's with a pitchfork or a crank or whatever it may be, um, and that's moving things around so they get exposed to air and don't have the chance to go anaerobic, as they say. And, and in commercial composting facilities, they have uh, a lot of times they'll have like windrows or they'll pump air into the pile and just make sure that, that things don't go anaerobic and that's when you have the methane creation. Um, Loria, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, said that you spoke about water related to beef, but how much water is there related to pork and chicken production? Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but it's a really good question. I do know in terms of greenhouse gas impact that it's usually like red meat, um, rumen animals like lamb and lamb, sheep, cows. Uh, those are the, the biggest culprits in terms of uh, what they're putting out into the air in terms of methane. And 
uh, livestock are the the biggest source of methane emissions in the country, but landfill methane, mostly driven by food waste, is the second largest source of methane. Um, I would guess that you know the the other the the pork and chicken industries probably are not quite as bad in terms of water, but are a, a significant draw on our water supply. And yes. I'd yeah. also imagine that because they're um, raised for less amount of time, they use less water. I think those cows are, are in, sort of in production for a bit longer. Yeah, um, yeah that's a good point. Um, those are all the questions we have currently in the chat. So we'll let you continue. Okay, if you have great. more questions, please type them in. Excellent. OK, so all right. Um, shifting gears from the doom and gloom a little bit to the, the proactive. Um, let's let's talk about where we go from here. So you've probably heard this mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle. And I think that's a fabulous framework for looking at solutions. And the EPA does as well. Uh, they put out this handy hierarchy of actions and it basically follows that that same idea of reduce, reuse, recycle. So uh, at the top, the most important thing we can do is to reduce the amount of food waste being created. And we can do that by doing a number of things, but um, and we'll, we'll get into them uh, one by one, but the main thing is, is just to, to focus on trimming the amount of wasted food being produced. Um, if we can't do that, then let's try to redistribute the excess food to people in need. Uh, if you can't do that, let the next best option is to feed livestock. Um, obviously, uh, hogs have, are a, a tried and true way of using human scraps, but a number of animals fill that role as well, especially uh, folks who've taken to having backyard chickens will know that, that they're serving that role also. Um, if you can't feed livestock, then the next best thing is industrial uses, which is a very vague term for uh, anaerobic digestion, like creating energy from wasted food or uh, rendering. And if we can't do any of the above, then we should focus on composting that excess food. And so only if um, you know we can't do any of those things should food be going to a landfill or incinerated. Unfortunately, in reality, this hierarchy is, is completely inverted when it comes to what's happening. And so 95% of excess food ends up in a landfill or an incinerator. So we've got plenty of work to do. So um, a couple of real like large scale solutions to, to look to is to, to try to be more careful all throughout the food chain, um, reducing waste everywhere we can. And my main point here is that the actions we take are not mutually exclusive. In fact, it's, it's kind of the opposite. So we can act wherever we encounter food in that supply chain. And I think that taking action at one part of the food chain will only lead to more awareness at another. Uh, a, a great example of that would be the, the imperfect produce uh, or the, the ugly fruits and vegetables. Like if, if we as consumers show, producer the, pr show producers that there's a market for those goods, then they'll harvest more of it and, and you know, they'll be quite happy to find another revenue stream. So focusing on uh, wherever you interact with the food chain and then also encouraging others who may be involved in creating food, uh, focusing on them being better at reducing waste, that's important. Um, another large scale solution is to create these food waste landfill bans. And here's a chance to turn to policy as a solution. There are five states that have passed these 
food waste landfill bans already. Several cities have done so. And it's really quite radical. And it's kind of counterintuitive that addressing the end of the supply chain will impact what's happening at various points before that. But if we don't have that safety net of just being able to throw stuff out, then the producer uh, will, the, the, the canner will need to find another use for those goods um, or compost it. The, the restaurant will need to make sure that, that they're maybe taking the vegetable trimmings and, and making a stock out of it um, or composting the remains. And so um, that one simple act, which uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and California have already passed, um, that works wonders in terms of both boosting comp the composting infrastructure and even creating jobs in the, the green energy world through uh, making it more affordable for anaerobic digestion plants to be built. Um, those are pretty expensive to, to build. The, the technology is, is very, very tricky. Uh, but if you know you're gonna have a steady stream of excess food, then it's, it makes it easier for investors to sign on. Anaerobic digestion is different than it just, it, it just decomposes without oxygen in the landfill. I don't understand what's the difference. Yeah, oh, great question. Um, so anaerobic digestion is like you have a big tank and you channel the, you dump all the food waste into it and you have this certain bacteria or bacterium uh, well, different kinds of bacteria used and they eat up the food waste and they basically are harnessing that methane. So they're letting it decompose anaerobically, but they, it's all captured and they're taking that methane and harnessing it and turning it into uh, compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas to use. I've seen it used uh, to power trucks. Um, so it's, it's basically like letting that landfill methane happen in a controlled way where you're then reaping the benefits of that methane creation. Whereas the landfill, you're just venting it out into the atmosphere and, and having it be an agent of, uh, of warming. Okay, so yeah, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, let's, let's keep food out of landfill. Uh, by hook or by crook, uh, by individual action or policy bans where possible. And that's, um, who knows, certainly something that, that could happen in Delaware. Uh, if you know any elected officials, that might be a good thing to push for. Um, but more in, in our direct control, uh, spreading awareness for this problem is incredibly important. And there's a really cool campaign out there that I teased earlier called Save the Food. And I'm not sure if you have seen any of these ads, but, but they're out there and they're expanding. And it's, it's kind of neat in that it's playing on this expiration date fear of, uh, or just the expiration date concept. And basically by taking a, a date away from that date label. I'm just saying it's best if used. So let's use that food and not waste it. Um, and then also following it with a, a little factoid on uh, how much water goes into producing one egg, for example, or the poundage, 290 pounds of food, uh, every the average American wastes in a year. So it's pretty cool. And, um, you know, there are several other campaigns out there more at like an institutional level. I've seen a bunch of colleges do this where, where they have campus-wide initiatives um, often with, with a cool slogan like taste not waste, um, uh, watch your waste, that kind of thing. And whatever we can do to get people thinking about not wasting food is, is going to be vital. Okay, and the last uh, big picture solution here is that we need to stop teaching kids that food is trash 
And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we need to show them that food is something to be treasured. Um, unfortunately, in schools, we, we haven't dedicated much resources to serving quality food. And we've really hamstrung the, the kitchen workers in most schools by taking out kitchens and uh, making them into essentially microwavers or, or food reheaters. And so the, the food quality in most places isn't great. And the, the timing of lunch can be strange. Uh, some kids are eating lunch at 10 a.m. or uh, gosh, possibly even earlier. And um, we're, we're essentially dooming kids to this situation where they don't have much time to eat the food because the lunch period might be squeezed. Um, and maybe lunch is right before recess and that's not a great idea. Whereas if recess happens first, kids build an appetite and then they eat more of what they're served. So uh, we need to enable kids uh, to be messengers of this, this problem, to, to teach them that food waste is something that shouldn't be happening and basically count on them as persuaders. Um, kids are really good at convincing their parents to do something or to not do something. And we've seen that with recycling. So uh, one simple way to do that is to, to not only boost awareness among kids, but to enable this kind of cafeteria food sharing and something as simple as, as having a food share table where if you're forced to take something because of the way the school lunch program works, then you can leave it on that table and someone who wants that item can pick it up. Uh, or you can take another milk if you know you're gonna drink it, things like that. And then at the end of the lunch period, what's left on the share table can actually be served again by the school. Uh, that can happen once, as long as everything's kept at the right temperature. And uh, it could even be shared to a local nonprofit. And there's several ways of doing that. And that's as long as it's a, a wrapped item or a whole fruit. So there's a real opportunity there, not just to reuse that food, but to educate the next generation to be food lovers and not food wasters, and also to be ambassadors for this issue. Okay, but hopefully everyone listening can also become a, an ambassador of sorts. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> just as now we're all part of this problem, we can so easily become part of the solution. And I definitely believe in the, the cumulative effect of action. So you doing something different will be noticed by friends and family. And uh, the next time you see your friend decline to take leftovers from a restaurant, maybe you can talk to them about one or two or three of the things you learned from this talk. Um, so yeah, be, be part of this solution or simply not waste as much food. That is, that is vitally important as well. So uh, a fabulous way to do that is to shop smarter. And what I mean there is, is to prevent the situation where we fill our, our fridge to the point we can't possibly use all of those items. So that, that might look different depending on how you lead your life. Um, everything's a little screwy with the pandemic, but uh, it's getting better. So um, maybe we can get back to more frequent, smaller trips to the store. Uh, being more nimble with our food supply tends to lead to less waste. Oh, but if you're just going to make that big uh, trip to the store or order uh, food delivery uh, once a week or, or more, or sorry, less often than that, then maybe it's really important to focus on that list and make that dedicated shopping list based on the meals you know you're going to make, uh, have a, a destination for most of the foods you buy so that you don't end up with, with things that are perishable where you don't know when to use them. Um, so yeah, just 
it's vital to, to make a list wherever you're, whichever method you're going for, I would advise a word of caution, just be careful who has access to that grocery list. You might end up with some exotic things like snakes on the list. Um, <clears throat> I think that was supposed to be snacks, but who knows? Maybe it's a, a maybe that was from a different culture. I'm not one to judge. All right, so the main point here is to avoid uh, creating this scenario. Um, and you know, if if you do end up in that position, the fridge is uh, is stuffed to the point you can't use everything. The freezer is a good waste preventer, but don't make it be just a waste delayer. You have to actually use the foods in your freezer. So I like to sometimes do a once a once a month freezer meal, like whatever I can find in there, pull it together and make a meal. Okay, um, earlier we were talking about date labels uh, as a potential solution. Someone asked about that. And I think that is great advice and uh, piggybacking on the Save the Food campaign, I would advise people to basically ignore date labels. Whew, I know that is a bit controversial and uh, my team of lawyers gets nervous every time I, I get to this point in the talk. Um, so I should probably have some small print somewhere saying I'm exempt from uh, liability, but what the heck, you know what? I trust your senses. I trust your sense of smell, of taste, of sight. And I trust you to know when a food will be good or bad. Uh, I trust your senses more than some random date stamped on a package. Because you know, a food can go bad before that date. Maybe it, it was left out in the sun on the loading dock for too long. Uh, maybe the refrigerator unit in the truck broke and uh, it got too warm. But you know, if, if you're not sure whether or not something's good or bad, then you know, give it a sniff, give it a taste, and I think you will know. And if you're not sure if you've ever had bad milk, you haven't. Trust me on that. Um, okay, there are some bills uh, that have been introduced in Congress as well to try to reform this date label situation uh, because there is this confusion over what those date labels mean. Um, nothing has quite happened on that, but there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of talk uh, about remedying that situation by basically shifting all of the, or distilling all of the multiple terms into uh, one term, just best if used by. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, another thing we talked about before, uh, this is exciting, just uh, trying to do your part to eat ugly or expand the range of what is acceptable. And you can really change how stores stock their produce section in particular, just by buying things that don't look quite right. Um, that, that can also happen at the farmer's market as well. Um, that's where you'll find even more strange or quirky or I, I say interesting looking food items. Um, but the larger point is that the stores are acting on our impulses and our behavior. And many people say they'd love to buy produce with personality or misfit produce, whatever it may be, but they don't actually do that when push comes to shove. So it's important to actually act on that. And as mentioned before, uh, there's, there are several companies that will ship you a box of misfit produce or imperfect produce. The, uh, the bottom right there is, is imperfect. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like it, you save a lot of money, you get to expand the range of acceptability with, with food items and you, you get a very healthy box of, of food to use. Um, so check into that if, if that seems like it's up your alley. Uh, next, what, another thing we can do to 
dramatically limit food waste is to be wise on portion size and basically try and end up with the right amount of food on your plate, either when eating out or serving people at your home. But that might be a bit of an extreme uh, on the other side of the equation, um, but basically avoiding this situation, uh, avoiding putting too much on, on someone's plate so that they have to either overeat or waste food, um, or I suppose save the food as leftovers, but don't put someone in a tricky situation. Uh, let people have some choice in what the quantity and the, the uh, type of food that ends up on their plate. And you know, I think most of you are, are probably doing that already, but allowing folks to serve themselves works wonders there. Okay, uh, next bit of advice is to really make doggy bags the norm when we're out to eat, but not that kind of doggy bag. Those are pretty fun, but not what I'm thinking of. Uh, and definitely not that kind of doggy bag, but rather this kind. And let's love our leftovers. And so when you're out to eat, yeah, you, know, you you paid for that food already. It's the green thing to do. It's the economical thing to do. Uh, why not take that food home? Um, or <clears throat> if you know you're not gonna use it, you can always box it up and see if you can give it to someone in need uh, who, who might not be worried about the, uh, the strict food safety requirements that, that are in place. Uh, as long as you feel good about it. Um, uh, you know, I wouldn't, give something to someone where I'd put my fork in or spoon into something else. But, you know, if it's half a pizza, that's a different story. Uh, but a lot of times one question I get often is that people know that they, they, they're not sure if they're gonna use the food and they don't wanna waste the packaging, uh, the, the impact of that packaging. But the best comparison or the best estimate I have is that 10 times more resources go into producing the food that you would waste than into producing those packages. So uh, when in doubt, take that food home. I know folks who eat out who carry their own bags and boxes with them to put their leftovers in. And I think that's a great idea. That is a great idea. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that a decent amount and, and I applaud that effort. And there's also, there's a, I don't know if there's anything like this where you live, but there's a, a thing called Green to Go, which is a, a nonprofit in Durham, North Carolina, that, that basically gives people reusable containers to take food home, and then they take it home, and then they drop it off at a drop-off point. The company washes it, and then you get another one. That's a so, great idea. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a good business idea. I've never, I've never seen that, but I've been hoping for something like that. We, with the um, the pandemic, we do a lot of carry out. We don't eat in the restaurants, but then we have all of these very well made, sturdy things that we don't have any use for, and we have piles of already. And most of them, oh, if if they've got recycle numbers on them so you can know if they're recyclable then you can do that so yeah that's a yeah that's a big if in in some cases but um you know you can there's plenty of uses for it and maybe it's a, a way to divvy up some excess that you're going to donate to neighbors or share something make some cookies and share them with neighbors or make art from it or start your indoor seeds for the, the spring growing season. Um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way to find a use for things. So I trust you'll, you'll succeed. Okay, um, I wanted to hit a few more points and then I'll, I'll open it up for further questions. Um, one thing that, that is really important to do is to promote food donation of that excess so this is the, the redistribution part of that hierarchy. And a lot, I find a lot of people don't know about this bill. It's one of my favorite 
uh, laws that was passed. And it's basically the, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act provides a, a, a way for people to donate food free from liability. So that means if, if I'm a restaurant or a supermarket or a caterer and I deem that food to be in good shape, I can donate it to a nonprofit organization and be free from liability. So there are plenty of restaurants and supermarkets that donate food, but a lot of them don't donate the most perishable or the healthiest items because they say they don't want to be sued or they're afraid if, if something goes bad, then the, the person will figuratively turn around and bite the hand that's fed them. And I'm here to tell you tonight that that's not a valid fear. And if that were to happen, they would be protected from liability. In addition, these are all of the liability suits that have happened when someone's received a donation and has uh, filed suit against the donor. Uh, and yes, that is intentionally left blank. So that has never happened. And so it's uh, an irrational fear. And in many cases, it's um, an excuse given by a store or restaurant that just doesn't really wanna bother with the, the trouble of packaging something up or, or finding a donor. Um, so, or, or finding a recipient, I should say. But uh, it's all the more important then for us to be proactive in encouraging stores and restaurants to donate and also for volunteering with organizations that do this kind of work, that they go out and uh, save or recover or rescue foods that otherwise would be trashed. Uh, there are plenty that, that do that work at the supermarket or restaurant level, but I would really encourage you to try to get involved with places that are getting the healthiest food possible, either from a, a farmer's market or from a farm. And that's usually done through gleaning. And I think the Society of St. Andrew and the Food Bank of Delaware do that kind of work uh, where they're, they're going out to those places and, and getting food that otherwise would be plowed under. Um, it's really exciting work and uh, a nice way to give back if you can actually uh, are able-bodied to do that work. Um, not too different from work you might do in your home garden, but um, has a little added impact of helping those in need. So I would definitely recommend gleaning as much as possible. And there's also a plant a row program, which I hinted at earlier, where you basically grow a row of food to then donate. And uh, I think the Food Bank of Delaware would be excited to receive those donations. But there's another website called ampleharvest.org which uh, allows you to put in your zip code and, and find recipient donate, uh, recipient orgs that will accept donations of fresh produce. And usually it's stuff people have grown in their backyard. So that's a neat way to be part of the solution. Can I just interrupt here for a second, Jonathan? We, yeah, sure. um, we at, DA, at DCH are starting a, our second year with something called Harvest 2021. And it's something we did last year where gardeners can grow produce for uh, the Food Bank of Delaware. We're partnering with PHS, which is the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society to um, as a response to COVID and food insecurity um, during COVID. So we're asking gardeners to grow extra produce and donate it to the food bank. So that goes right along with what you've been mentioning. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, very timely. Excellent. Okay, um, so yeah please do one of those things if you're able to. And um, I'd say at the very least, uh, you know, it's last and it's sort of least in the hierarchy, uh, but it's important as well is to compost and to basically keep food out of the landfill or out of the waste stream. And I like to say that I'm a pretty mediocre composter, but at least I'm happy that I'm not throwing things out. and. You know, sometimes I do get a usable soil amendment 
And I know that, that you gardeners would, would be excited to have that kind of thing to, to help your plants and flowers grow. Um, so yeah, why not give it a whirl? The hidden benefit as well of composting, and I'm sure the, uh, that all of you out there who are already doing this know, is that you really see your flaws. You, you can glean some, some uh, habits from what you end up composting. And so you might be able to learn that you always buy too much of this or that. Um, I always buy too many green beans. I find that that ends up, they, they go quickly and people in my house don't seem to love them. So, you know, then you adjust and buy a smaller amount, things like that. So uh, a great learning opportunity and a way to prevent uh, climate change through landfill methane emissions and a usable soil amendment. It's a real win-win-win there. Okay, but on a larger uh, scale or in the bigger picture, it's, I would argue, even more important that we connect with our food and allow young people to do so as well. And so just the closer we can get to our food supply, the more we know the people who grow it or the more we grow it ourselves, um, the, the more we're going to treat that food with care and treat it as the precious commodity that it is. Um, cooking is a, a great way to do that, as is growing your own food or, or shopping in a farmer's market. But um, cooking is especially vital in that we really see the fruits of our labor and um, we are able to, to create something wonderful from the raw ingredients that maybe we've grown ourselves. And uh, that kind of alchemy and effort really goes a long way toward seeing food as uh, really the, the magical quantity or entity that it is. And um, you know, I'm sure you're getting used to cooking more and more, but if you're not, um, you know, I'm pretty confident that, that we can all find our way in the kitchen. I mean, kids are doing it, cats are doing it. Uh, I have faith that, that you can be as good a chef as you set your mind to be. And, and just to close with a couple of thoughts here, <sighs> uh, it's, it's hard. Uh, when I think about the stakes, it's hard to, to keep a positive outlook, but here's how I do it. So in 2050, they estimate that there will be 9.8 billion people on this planet. And I write it that way to, to show you that that's a lot of zeros and a lot of mouths to feed that correspond with that figure. So when food planners see those numbers, they automatically jump to these conclusions that we need to turn to more genetically modified crops or cut down more rainforests to create more arable land, things like that. And that might come to pass, that might be necessary, but why don't we focus instead on being more efficient with our food supply and see where that gets us. We're going to have to be more efficient with our food at some point. We're going to have to really turn our attention toward wasting less and using more. And so let's do that sooner rather than later to, to have the most significant impact that we can. And uh, just on a real basic level, uh, we have enough food on this planet to feed everyone. So, uh, the least we can do is try to use the food we have to feed the people in need. And really uh, solving the hunger question is just a question of will, finding the social or political will to redistribute some of that excess or to maybe pass a bill that lifts people out of poverty through food aid. And we just saw with, with the, last, uh, the last bill that was passed, like how, a uh, single vote can impact so many lives and dramatically reduce the amount of need out there. And so that's just a matter of us being drivers of change and being 
loud and advocating for what I would argue is the right thing to do in, in helping people in need. So with you on board, I'm sure that we will be able to solve that problem and solve it soon. With that, I thank you for your time and I would love to take your further questions. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, we've had a lot of discussion in the chat um, and a bunch of questions as well. So I'm gonna to try to filter through all of it uh, to get the questions out to you. Great. Um, Dolores yeah. is interested in um, pet food waste. Um, do you have any information on how pet food um, waste impacts climate uh, or these numbers? Okay, well, I'm not entirely sure if you mean pet food as a, a, a source of using stuff that would be wasted because that's sort of what happens a lot um, with like excess products from the meat industry, we'll say, and, and some others as well. Um, but that's sort of a, a, a good use of extra food and it's similar to the, uh, the feeding livestock part of that hierarchy, um, which I can probably zip back to. Um, but if you're not thinking about that um, in terms of wasted pet food, I know that a lot of food banks will accept donations uh, if you have excess pet food. And um, yeah, or even just like sharing with neighbors, uh, using neighborhood listservs wherever possible, um, getting that stuff to people who want it. I, don't, I think that's a pretty tried and true uh, way to, to save that stuff from going to waste. Great. Uh, Loria is asking um, if you have any information on the difference in food waste since COVID started with people cooking more at home. Have those numbers come out yet? Um, there, there's like anecdotal stuff about COVID food waste. Um, I would say there's much more waste at the farm level because say a lot of colleges canceled orders, um, restaurants did as well, um, I think. And it's also this, so that was like the last summer uh, and spring. This summer or and spring, it's tricky because no one really knows how open things are going to be. So it's hard to predict if you're a farmer, how much you should grow. Uh, so that kind of disruption has led to a lot of waste at the farm level. The household level uh, sort of cuts both ways. People, there were a lot of panic buys and, and people really stocking the fridge with all kinds of things just because it was hard to get food at the beginning um, and still might be hard for some folks or you might not go very often to the store. So you wanna buy plenty while you're there and that often puts you in a tricky place. Um, but we're also home a lot more. So there's more opportunity to be creative with our leftovers and to use what we have. So, uh, I mean, I think at the household level, it's, it's uh, fairly steady at that uh, roughly 25% waste level. Maybe it's gone down a tiny bit, but that's just me guessing. Okay. Um, Dee is talking about, um, she says, Delaware doesn't do this yet but in some places menus have to include calorie counts. Um, and she's wondering if that would encourage people to reduce their consumption. Have you seen anything about that? Um, calorie counts on menus and things like that. You know, reducing to help people reduce their portion sizes. Mm, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I have seen, I mean, I've talked to people who, will say when I go out to eat, I, you know, I, it's like the old dieting trick. I cut the food in half and I, you know, I eat half of it. Uh, I've also <laughs> heard from people who said they cut the, the plate in half or the food item in half and throw out <laughs> half of it. And that's uh, less um, savvy, but, uh, but yeah, I think knowing how much you're going to eat, knowing the amount of calories that have been given to you will help you in that calculus uh, in making that decision of how much to eat. And so, yeah, 
having that on the menu will certainly help once you get that food and it also help you making decisions when ordering. Um, and my pet peeve is being at a restaurant where you, know, you don't know how much food you're going to get. And so it's tricky. And especially if you're not someone who likes leftovers and you know, at the, the tried and true story of like the couple going out to eat and ordering one entree and splitting it and, that's, and it's the perfect amount. Like that might work at some places or it might leave you fairly hungry at others. In which case there's always dessert. That's a good point. Um, I scrolled, I'm sorry if you can hear my cat oh, I... joining us. Um, Vic is asking any thoughts on GMOs um, and are there pros or cons to GMOs that are engin engineered to prolong shelf life? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, my first thought on that topic is like that we can do better on our own uh, if, with a little awareness and uh, some conscientiousness on using things before they go bad. But um, I, I do know that, that we could all use some help at times. And so, um, you know, having things that last longer is kind of cool. Uh, I, I don't know. I personally don't really want to see too many things genetically modified, but I also know that there are many foods that have been around for a while that, that are the results of genetic modification. And it's just kind of uh, how we define the term, but you know, I like nectarines, but that is basically a genetically modified food. Um, so it's it's tricky, I guess is the short answer, and I don't I don't have all the answers on it, but those are my feelings there. Um, those are all the questions in the chat. So folks, if you have any more, please put them in um, because we'll be wrapping up. But lots of people commenting that they have to sign off, but they're very thankful. Um, they loved the presentation. Um, I have a question, and that is that um, the slide you had about the food uh, tags, you know, that, that Best Buy date. Yep. It said chickens, it takes 55 gallons of water for an egg. And I've got some backyard chickens and I can tell you they don't take more than a half a gallon a day. I'm just wondering how they come up with those numbers. I mean, obviously my chickens are not industrial chickens in a, in a you know, confined space. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. As yeah, to I, I think it's um, a lot of the water used to like wash out the spaces in those confined farming operations. So less about what they're drinking and more about how they're running it and having to clean out the cages so that they don't get you know, even more disease than they often are. That makes sense. All right. Well, it looks like we have no more questions. I just want to remind everyone that we have more um, in this series. So please make sure you're registering for those on our website. Make sure you're registering for our Harvest 2020 if you're a gardener um, and are interested in donating some produce. That'll be up on our website soon as well. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. This was great. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and, and thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you so much. All, all right. right. All right. Have a great evening. Watch your waste.